We will now move on to questions to the Minister for Health. I call Emma Sheeran to ask the first question. Ms Sheeran. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Domri Solar Care workers provide a vital service to over 23,000 people in Northern Ireland, allowing them to con continue to live independently. While there are some time particular challenges in rural areas given the longer travel distances, we have seen incre increasing pressures right across our domiciliary care service provision for a number of years. Over the past 12 months, I am pleased to say the social care workforce has expanded significantly, with an increase of 3,409 registered workers since 2019. While this is very welcome, more staff are clearly still needed. This is not least because the COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound effect on the ability of domiciliary care providers to deliver services. One impact was the number of staff unable to work because they were required to self-isolate. However, at the onset of the pandemic, many service users and their families opted to suspend their existing domiciliary care package. My department moved quickly to put in place a guarantee of income from domiciliary care providers to ensure there was no loss of capacity in this critical service at that time. In return for this guarantee, we asked providers to improve their sick pay for staff unable to work for COVID-19 related reasons. Power to people was clear, and I am clear that the only way to make this service sustainable in the long term is through improved terms and conditions. My officials are finalising a business case which set out some of the costs for achieving this. It will be challenging given the current financial pressures and uncertainties to meet these costs, and it will need executive support, but I am determined to do my best to make it happen. Through the pandemic, we have also made sure that domiciliary care providers have access to PPP, PPE where they need it, and that the Health and Social Care Trust continues to provide millions of items free of charge. Ms. Sheeran. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. And I'm sure, obviously, you'll be aware of the extreme sensitivity of this subject. And I don't in any way want to overstate that. Domiciliary care workers, as you've outlined, are probably one of the most uh, stretched of all across our health service. And I know that the issue of um, an unavailability of care packages in rural areas, such as my own in Mid Ulster, is a massive pressure point, both for the workers on the ground and also for the families that are affected. I've been informed um, in the past that your department does not keep a record of the number of care packages that never get fulfilled because the person requiring a care package passes in hospital before they're allowed to, to enter their home with a care package. I'm asking if you could start to record this in order that the high incidence of such um, incidents is recorded and the great need is recorded properly. Um, and I thank the member for, I suppose, a, a very specific follow-up question in regards to that. I am, you know, she, she did ask that in a written question and I'm aware of the reply, but it's something we will look into now that she's asked for it and whether that's feasible to be done, but also to make sure there is a useful outcome should that information be gathered. Members, before I call uh, Mr Alan Chambers, I don't wish to curtail any member and I don't wish to curtail the Minister, but obviously, given the current climate, I know that there are so many people that have questions that they want to ask about health, if we could use the half an hour that we have judiciously. Mr Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister detail what measures he has taken to shore up and support domiciliary care providers during the pandemic? Um, and again, I thank the Member for his point. I did cover it, uh, I suppose, briefly in, in my initial answer, but from June of this year until the end of October, I introduced financial support measures for domiciliary care providers who were contracted to the Health and Social Care Trusts. Under these arrangements, providers had their income supplemented uh, to a level that was 100 per cent of an average of the three months prior to the pandemic. And in return for this support, providers are expected to ensure workers were paid at least 80 per cent of their normal earnings above the statutory sick pay when on sick leave for reasons related to COVID-19. I have also recently agreed a fund of £5 million for providers to claim against reasonable expenses incurred as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in addition, health and social care trusts continue to, provide, to support providers with millions of items of free PPE every month. Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. 
So, Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister mentioned about PPE for those domiciliary care workers, and I was wondering if you could tell us, Minister, what assurances you can give us that those care workers at the front line have the necessary PPE rather than just merely their employers saying that they have the correct amounts. Um, one of the things we did through the first wave of the pandemic was to make sure that every provider, every care supplier, and every, every employer had a direct line into the trust. Uh, those supply chains are established through your, your business service organisation into trusts where any supplier can actually draw down PPE as and when needed. Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Many family carers at the end of their resilience due to the disruption of not only domiciliary care but also respite care and day services. Can the Minister give an update on the publication of a plan for the resumption of these services as voted for by the Assembly on July the 7th? Um, and I think the member, uh, it is one of those areas that is continually under pressure due to the reallocation of, of some of our staff, but it is a, it's a piece of work that has been done on a regional basis to ensure that there is equity of service across the entirety of Northern Ireland. Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers as well thus far. Minister, as someone who worked in the health service and understands what unmet need is, and unmet need has been around for many, many years, can you uh, tell the House how your department is capturing that unmet need? Um, and I think, um, you know, covering a point, the, me the member makes, makes a valid point that has always been there, and domiciliary care is actually meeting um, the, or the demand for age trips, the supply that we currently have. And I think that's why it is a significant step that we have increased the number of registered workers since, since 2009 by, by nearly three, over 3,400. Um, and again, at this point in time, that demand is currently outstripping the provision that we have due to members, being off, members of, the, of that profession being off due to COVID and the community incidents. So it's about putting in that support package uh, for the employers, but also making it a profession that people want to go into. Because as the member will know, that many of the individuals who work in, in this sector are there by vocation and by calling because of the support that they want to give to people in their own communities. And they do that to a very high standard and currently under very extreme pressures. Ms Liz Kevins. Um, and I, I thank the member. COVID-19 continues to have a devastating impact right across the, group, the globe, uh, and with the recent surge of cases in Northern Ireland highlighting the need for ongoing vigilance. In order that our health and social care sector is in the best possible position to respond to the virus and to reduce the impact of local people, it is essential that we take expert advice and learn from international practice. Throughout the pandemic to date, the Northern Ireland Executive has received expert advice and recommendations from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor in respect of the most appropriate public health response. This advice has been based on the emerging evidence from the rest of the UK and the rest of the world. For example, the Chief Scientific Advisor attends the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies and reviews the evidence from the Scientific Pandemic Influ Influenza Group on modelling which examines the data on the trajectory of the virus both nationally and inter internationally. In addition, evidence from UK government analysis and published scientific papers is regularly reviewed with regard to international experience. The need to consider the best available evidence and practice applies not only to the strategic public health response, but all parts of the health and social care sector in responding to COVID-19. This can be seen in the reduction in mortality rates for those diagnosed with COVID-19 as experience has provided enhanced insight into the best form of treatment. However, as a, a novel virus, it is important to recognise that the evidence of COVID-19 is changing over time, while there is often not a consensus on the most appropriate response. Ms. Kimmins. Um, and thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Minister then if data is being shared effectively uh, north and south um, with his counterparts in the south in line with the memor memorandum of understanding that has been agreed? Um, the memorandum of understanding um, is, is working well. Uh, I think it does need, uh, and there is areas of enhancement. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we've seen in that, especially over the weekend, uh, was our reaction in travel restrictions uh, from Denmark. Uh, it took a, an engagement from ourselves uh, with the health minister and also 
uh, the Transport Minister from Westminster engaging with the Transport Minister in the Republic of Ireland to make sure that there was a sharing of anyone who was under through the, the Irish Republic, uh, actually through Dublin Airport, uh, that had been in Denmark or had travelled through Denmark while we put in those restrictions. But that engagement still is ongoing. Um, the Chief Medical Officer and senior colleagues meet with their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland on a weekly basis to discuss the approach of COVID-19 and their experience of responding to the pandemic. Mr. Chair, Alistair. Uh, Minister, in the first wave of the uh, virus, it was quite clear that the impact on our care homes was catastrophic. Why was it then that in the intervening period, until I think last week, a testing of staff was only once every fortnight? Uh, now it, you said it would be once a week. Sure, it should be even every day or every other day. And what is the international standard? Because yesterday we had 139 uh, outbreaks in our care homes. Did we learn nothing in terms of testing in care homes from the first wave? Um, I, actually, um, in regards to, to the members' comments, we have increased the, the recommendation was that we tested staff um, every fortnight in residence once a month, and unless the home tested positive or showed a confirmed case, then we increased uh, the testing capacity. In the initial case where a home hadn't had identified case, we were using Pillar 2. Once a home has an identified case, either that should that be in a resident or in a member of staff, it moves into Pillar 1, which is our own Northern Ireland-based testing programme, so we can get a, a quicker response um, to those test results. We have increased to testing once every two weeks to, to get that frequency actually updated. The member refers to the number of care homes that we currently have rated as confirmed cases. I can inform the member that I, I think it is about 46 per cent of those homes are actually confirmed as being positive because of staff only, not residents. So the increased testing programme has actually proved beneficial, where it is actually indi indicating and identifying staff. Um, who may be asymptomatic and actually identifying them so that they don't take the virus actually into the home where those residents are actually more vulnerable to the, to the virus. Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answers to, his, to the question so far. Does the Minister accept that other countries have a much more stringent uh, test and trace process? And can the Minister update this House on improvements to the test trace system that are needed and when these will be delivered? Thank you. Um, I think one of the things that, that often happens in regards to our test, trace and protect system is that the failings of other systems are pointed towards our system. In regards to the, the current system itself, um, in, the past, in the past week uh, we have transferred 4,450 cases to test, trace and protect. Of those cases transferred, uh, 4,023 of them were successfully detected. Now, that's a success rate of over 90 per cent. Uh, at any international standard, they say 80 per cent is what should be reached for. Of those 4,023 cases that were identified and contacted, uh, there was actually a further 9,267 contacts were identified from those positive cases. Of those 9,267, 9,173 were eventually contact. That's a success rate of 99 per cent. So when it comes to the failings being pointed out of our test, trace and protect system, I think people often look at the criticism that's happen, happening to the one in Westminster and then try to allay those uh, dispersions on our own system. Uh, in regards to the improvements that we have made over the summer and we brought it forward when we saw that dramatic increase in positive cases, we went to a texting alert service for some member, or for some people who had tested positive. We also went for an online first system, where members could actually go online and identify their contacts, so that it was easier for whatever way someone who tested positive uh, to interact. If they wanted to talk to someone on the phone, or if they wanted to do it online, or they wanted to respond by text message. So that's what we've done in the last number of weeks. But I think, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one, one thing that should be noted, and I think you know, we often look to Germany as best practice. Germany has actually said that when you're getting a case rate of anything over 50 cases per 100,000 of population, there's no way any test, trace and protect system can keep on top of that. So that's why it's, it's vitally important that we get our case rate down so that the real benefit of test, trace, protect and isolate can actually, 
actually come to the fore as well. So it's all part of the overall package. The, the more, the fewer cases we have, the more more impact and the more effects the test tracing tax actually has. Pam Cameron. Thank you, um, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. And in terms of um, testing in the care sector, um, I'd like to ask the Minister who will um, look after that administrative burden, given the independent care sector have said that they cannot cope with the increase uh, of testing, effectively doubling from two weeks to one week? Um, I think one of the things that we, we actually did in regards to that, and it was, I suppose, a, a strategic approach, was we actually put additional funding into the care home um, sector a fortnight before uh, we announced we were increasing the, the testing frequency as well, so that that money can actually be drawn down and used uh, to supply that administrative support uh, that those homes need. Also, provide additional staff, if need be, to come in and do those tests, you know, which can take up to 10 or 15 minutes. To perform for either for a resident or for staff member as well. So there's additional financial supports there already um, from my department to the care home sector. Ms. Claire Bailey. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, in response to the original question asked, the Minister made reference to advice received from both the Chief Medical Officer and the Scientific Officers. Can I ask the Minister, does he have the authority to act solely um, in? moving forward with implementing recommendations from experts, or does he need the approval of the whole executive? Um, in regards to, to the current regulations 9 and 10, uh, they fall uh, on, on Thursday night at midnight, so it would take the support of the executive to bring forward further recommendations. If they fall at that point, I think we move back to the, to the bare basics, basics that are actually there in regulation 2 which still stand and are, are current. Mr Jerry Carroll. Thank you. Uh, does the Minister have any concern that the phrase living with COVID is being used by some ministers and the executive, as it appears to be completely out of step with international best practice and more in line with countries that have had a very high death toll uh, and economic ruin as well? Um, I, I think one of the challenges around phraseology and language used um, since the, the outbreak and the first wave is always something that every politician should, should be careful of because of the impression that it gives. Um, I, I've been clear that you know, the, the phraseology living with COVID may be useful in a point where we actually have uh, a vaccine, where we have the virus under control at this moment in time. I don't think we have in Northern Ireland because of the increased rates that we have. But one thing I will say to the member, whether it's living with COVID, one thing I don't want is more people dying from COVID. Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, question three. Um, and uh, I thank the member. Testing through the national testing program is managed uh, by the Department of Health and Social Care in London, and I am advised that a few su such incidents have been reported uh, through the Public Health Agency. Um, my officials have been made aware. Upon investigation by the Public Health Agency and the HSC. Uh, they have advised that it has not received any specific details to enable the issue to be investigated further. My officials will continue to liaise with the HSC on this matter as required, and the HSC has advised that inv individuals impacted by such an incident should contact the 119 helpline to provide their specific details for further investigation. Ms. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you. And thanks, the Minister, for his answer. Um, Minister, this is a little bit concerning because I know certainly I have been advised by three individuals that I know personally, um, one accountant, one uh, solicitor, and another is a social worker, um, that all got positive test results at, at tests they, they weren't able to attend. Now, we know there is a lot of good has been done during this pandemic, but there are also people out there that want to do uh, mischief as well. And we know that there are discretionary support grants available for people that test positive for them or their family members. And and I just would like you just to, to look at this further uh, and to, to, to look at those figures and see if there's any patterns or any change or any increase that has happened in recent weeks, because it's public knowledge, certainly within my uh, area I represent, that this can be done. Um, and, and again, I thank the member. It's actually something her party leader, the First Minister, had also raised with me um, earlier in the week, and we had contacted the HSC to see if that was a possibility. Now, they are looking into their systems to make sure it doesn't happen or it can't happen. Because I, I think it would be 
it would be unquestionable that somebody would fake a positive COVID test for the sake of a pay payment, because not only the, the pressure that that puts on other individuals and their own family members, but also our health service, by making it look as if we have a higher in incidence rate than we actually do. But one thing I would say to the member, unfortunately, when we see the number of positive cases compared to the number of hospitalisations, uh, to the number of people who are currently in ICU, it doesn't seem to be that it's a widespread practice. One of the difficulties PHA, PHA and DHSC actually had was, although the member has said she's aware of three individuals, no one was prepared to give their contact details, name or address or identification, where they could actually follow it through the system to see if that was happening. But it's something that DHSC are aware of, and so is PHA. Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. My, my question to the Minister is concerning what is happening in Liverpool in terms of rapid and mass testing, and I wonder if he has any thoughts on, on whether those mechanisms could be deployed here in Northern Ireland. Um, what we're observing in, in Liverpool at the minute is a pilot mass testing, and I think it will be useful. Um, but what we want to also do as being part of the observation group um, that is overseeing what is happening and lear learning the lessons from what is happening is to make sure that that sort of mass testing can be utilised uh, to its best and most effective, but also that any individual who is tested positive also receives the correct support and advice. Um, I think it's easy when we look at Liverpool to, to put it in context as a large city. When you put in context that Liverpool as a population and a response actually larger than Northern Ireland, so it's about using mass testing most effectively to, to the region. Uh, we will be looking at a number of pilots uh, once that, that once the efficacy of, of the testing system should a bilateral flow uh, actually proves efficient, and whether we do that by a sectoral basis rather than a geographical basis is still something that my expert advisory group on testing is currently exploring. Ms. Paula Bradshaw. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, the DHSC in England is issuing new guidance for clinically extremely vulnerable people to patients providing them with a formal shielding notification that they can act, that can act as guidance for employers. Are you going to reintroduce shielding letters here? Um, the Chief Medical Officer is meeting his shielding advisory group uh, tomorrow to see what steps we need to take uh, should that replicate um, what England is currently doing. Uh, that guidance and updated advice will be taken as to where we are in Northern Ireland in regards to uh, the spread of COVID-19, uh, where we are in regards to ER, and also the direct effect it would have on that, that specific group of individuals in Northern Ireland. I know that uh, Mr Kildern, you and Mr McCrossan had indicated uh, we have only eight minutes left, and I am seeing there Mr Kildern is number one on the topical questions list, and Mr McCrossan is number four. So I hope they'll forgive me if I move on to the next question. I call Mr. Keith Buchanan. Question four, please. Um, and I, I thank the member for his question. And with the speaker, or deputy speaker's indulgence, I may take more than two minutes for this answer because of the, the nature of it. Uh, since taking up my post as Minister of Health, I've been very clear that mental health is one of my key, key priorities. I have created a mental health champion, and I have published the mental health action plan which includes a dedicated COVID-19 mental health response plan. My officials are also working on developing a new 10-year mental health strategy, which I intend to publish for consultation by the end of the year. And also since taking up the post of minister, I have already provided additional funding for mental health. This includes 1.5 million for the implementation of the mental health action plan secured through June monitoring, approximately an additional 300,000 for mental health co-production work secured through June monitoring as well, an additional 180,000 for suicide prevention secured through June monitoring, 1.5 million for my department to support the Department of Education with their work to support mental health in schools, to assist suicide prevention in 2020-21, uh, 649,000 has been allocated to, to towards zero suicide initiatives in HSC trusts, an additional 190,000 has been allocated to enable the continued delivery of the multiple agency triage team project and a further 60,000 has been allocated to the Dairy Crisis Intervention Service to allow its continuation to the end of the year. The Executive has also jointly agreed to fund the Mental Health Champion with 500,000 per year, and furthermore, over the last couple of years, a programme of capital investment to provide immediate improvements to the old mental health facilities has seen around 3.5 million in funding, which will directly benefit mental health patients. I welcome the additional COVID funding made available for the Department of Health through the HSC 
uh, through this particularly challenging time, including to support mental health services. I am seeking to make available from this funding up to £2.6 million to ensure capacity across the mental health services, including support for adult acute mental health bed management network and the provision of additional nurses and funding for psychology therapies uh, and the waiting lists. Going forward, the new mental health strategy will provide the strategic direction for mental health services when the full strategy is published in July 2021. I intend to also publish a 10-year funding plan, and this will provide a compre comprehensive outline of the funding needs required for the future mental health services. Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, the focus is currently on, on COVID, and rightly so. However, the strains on other conditions and pressure on people's uh, personal lives is putting pressure on the mental health of our population across Northern Ireland. Is this attention to the pandemic outweighing other conditions and the strains that puts on people's mental health? Um, I, I think the, you know, the member raises that point of the additional mental health strains that COVID has brought um, to the population of Northern Ireland, no matter um, should that be in, in their populace itself, but also in our health professions as well, because of the stresses and strains um, that they, they cope with. And that's why, when we produced the Mental Health Action Plan, we included a specific section for COVID-19 to pick up the specific points uh, and the additional points that are being brought to bear uh, during the additional pressures, or should it be from um, self-isolation, should it be just in regards to the loss of a loved one due to COVID and how that has affected many people across Northern Ireland. So the additional pressures in their mental health service are being compounded due to COVID, but it's, it's also a part of our, our health and social care system that needed additional funding, that needed additional support pre-COVID. Uh, and I'm pleased that due to the support that we've got across the executive and even from New Decade, new approach and the commitments that are there, that that support is now coming forward and that work is being championed uh, by our interim mental health champion, Professor Trevon O'Neill. Ms. Earlier, Flynn. For me, I'll go to last and I'd uh, like to thank the Minister for all those really positive initiatives around mental health. It's greatly appreciated amongst the sector. But just very quickly, I'm conscious the Mental Health Action Plan was announced six months ago. It contained the um, specialist community perinatal services. And I'm just wondering, I know that the, the sector and the perinatal mental health campaigners are awaiting in suspense. Um, if the Minister can confirm when the funding could be made available for those, um, those services. Thank you. Um, the business case for specialist community perinatal mental health services was received by the PHA and officials in mental health and capacity unity reviewed the document and consulted with their professional colleagues before requesting further evidence from the PHA to support their proposals. Following a further review of the amended business case, there still remain several minor discrepancies and PHA have agreed to complete these amendments as soon as possible. The PHA has noted that their response to the current COVID pandemic uh, has added substantial pressures to this workload. Recurrent costs associated with the business case are significant, with high costs approached to the proposed extensive multidisciplinary team complement proposed for each trust. I approve funding for the 2021 for perinatal mental health as part of the Mental Health Action Plan and in the June monitoring round. This action requires recurrent funding and so creates an inescapable pressure of 4.7 million recurrently. The business case proposes a phased implementation with the first phase requiring um, 3.4 million and an additional 1.3 million for the second phase. A submission seeking approval of the business case and the recurrent funding will be sent to me on receipt of the finalised business case from the PHA. And I had that answer prepared because I knew it was something the member would raise because it is something she has championed since her time in this House. Ms. Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I'm mindful of the time, so uh, I'll be quick. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, can the Minister identify if any additional funding from his department uh, will go towards those um, with mental health uh, issues struggling with addiction and for those who face uh, a dual diagnosis? Thank you. The, the increased um, level of, of dual diagnosis, especially during lockdown, has been something uh, that has been, I suppose, brought to the fore. I know the little party group um, that has been established uh, in the Assembly is also something that has raised the issue and something that my department is working on. Initially, I think um, it was brought to the House and, and questioned and debated. Um, what often happened was that that dual diagnosis fell as actually as two diagnoses rather than being brought together in one place. And that's the challenge and the point of work that has gone through my department and through the various trusts 
at that minute so that the person can receive the appropriate support, guidance and, and help that they currently need. Ten seconds for Mr Biggs and ten seconds for the Minister. Um, thank the Minister for his update and his detailed response regarding COVID and additional mental health pressures. But can the Minister provide an update of the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Group? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question. Uh, contrary to media reports suggesting an increase, um, suicide rates in Northern Ireland have remained uh, relatively stable uh, over the last decade. Uh, that funding is in place and the mental health funding, as I detailed earlier on, um, is approximately three hundred million per year, uh, which is between only five to six percent of the total HSC funding, and has accepted that this is significantly lower to other places. So that's why I continue to put in bids and also increase the finance and the pressures that we seek to make sure that we can get a, a, a support package, uh, not just financially but also in personnel to support those people who need it. Thank you, Minister. That ends the period for listed questions. So we'll now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Colin Gildernew. Prayer last can call you, and I will forward my supplementary on in relation to that. Because in terms of my topical, I wanted to ask the, the minister what plans his department has to secure a COVID-19 vaccine for our population here. Um, and I thank the member because it is it is very topical uh, at this minute in time. Um, the UK government, acting on behalf of the whole of the UK, has access actually to six potential COVID-19 vaccine candidates. And this reflects a national strategy to ensure that we have supply of vaccines should any of those prove safe and effective. The vaccines are currently at various stages. One has been announced yesterday, which still undergoes rigorous testing and the development process that they must complete before they can be considered for use in a vaccine programme. Uh, of the one that has been announced yesterday, um, we, uh, the United Kingdom, would be uh, eligible, and I think has pre-bought over 20 million uh, vaccination doses, of which will be distributed uh, by Barnet across the devolved administrations, which would leave us with 5,750 uh, doses, which would be the equivalent of initially vaccinating 255,000 people. I would stress to the member that this is one out of six potential uh, vaccine candidates. This is the first one to be brought forward. Mr. Gildernew. And given that we have, as you, as you said, heard from one company who have uh, made some developments in terms of their, their progress, but can the Minister explain how those 255,000 people then, uh, how that would be rolled out and what priority groups he would, he would be considering at this point in time? Would it be um, potentially care home residents, health and social care staff, or those who were previously advised to shield? Um, and, and again, I, I thank the member, and it's, it's one of those decisions that is actually taken out of my hands. Uh, one of the things we do uh, as a Department of Health across, actually across all four nations to ensure the, the, the continuity of supply, that decision, should it be for any vaccination programme, is actually handed over to the JCVI, which is the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. So they decide what, even what flu vaccines we should prepare and buy, buy in advance, and then also what groups should be allocated uh, and in what preference of order. Uh, they have already done an additional or an initial uh, trawl as to where they see the priority uh, for a COVID-19 vaccine. One of the things, or I suppose one of their, their main thrusts, uh, thrusts is by age and by working sector. So the first section that or the first sector um, that they're looking at is those people in care homes and also the care home working sector. Uh, the next section will be those over 85, and then that will move down into uh, those working in the health and social care systems, and then it will be ratified by age group. Uh, the JCVI is currently undergoing that stratification of who will be accessible. Uh, I'll write to the member with that because it is accessible and also inform the committee and update the House should that be useful. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Gemma Dolan. Good pre last can call you. Um, Minister, given the difficulties that we've all witnessed with COVID nineteen testing, do you believe the current test trace and protect approach is fit for purpose? Um, I, th I think the member um, I, I gave a, a few statistics for our current test trace and protect uh, system are there on. It does I think come under criticism because of what happens in other places at times. 
Um, and I think uh, uh, the committee a couple of weeks ago, some of the, the management team and it came under unfair criticism and personal attack, which was un unfortunate. Uh, what I would say, that dedicated team, there's now 220 uh, tracers in there working under three different employment contracts, should it be full-time, part-time or on-call bank, so that they can flex up. Uh, we have made some advances um, over the summer in regards to people being able to con be contacted by text message, but also online first as well, so that those digital uh, ability to trace, test and protect uh, is being enhanced continually. But what I also said, and I think in response to another question, uh, Mr Deputy Chairman, ev even the best system in the world, when we get those large numbers, does not uh, simply rely on a test, trace and protect system to bring it under control. Um, COVID takes a multitude of, of different, uh, different tools uh, to actually bring back under control. And as Germany, I think, has indicated themselves, which is also lo often lauded as the most efficient test rate and protect system, are actually saying that once you get over 50, 000, or 50 cases per 100,000, no test trace and protect system can effectively manage that. Currently, we're sitting at 200 per 100,000, so we have a far way to go. I'd rather see us dropping the incidence of COVID-19 and then being able to rely on test chase and protect and isolate and support to provide, the, I suppose, that enhanced service that actually manages and keeps COVID-19 under control. Ms. Dolan. Thanks, Minister. And you have touched on this briefly in your answer, um, but we've seen early on that the WHO and others stress the need for a find, test, trace, isolate and support strategy. Uh, do you have any plans to renew the approach to cover all these elements? It's, it's something that's actually ongoing. It's a conversation that's ongoing between my department and the Department of Communities, which is held by, by the members, um, Minister Karen McKillen, and it is about how we actually provide those additional supports. Um, there is a, a non-refundable payment loan which can be drawn down, and the conversation that I suppose that has been raised at this moment in time are our system it's means tested so anyone who earns le um, sorry anyone who earns over twenty one thousand pound per annum is not eligible for that because it has been handled through Department of Communities and Social Services. So it's something that uh, myself and the Minister of Communities are currently looking at as well to, to ensure that anyone who does test positive or becomes a contact to someone who's positive is supported and encouraged to self-isolate and remain at home uh, so they're not put, on, put under a financial burden um, to actually get back to work or out into the community as well. So it's a holistic approach that we are taking forward to make sure that those supports are there. Mr. Jerry Kelly. Uh, the Minister may remember on the 23rd of September the CMO advised that uh, um, shielding advice should not change. I wonder would the Minister um, expand on the, the basis of that assessment? Um, I I thank the member um, for his update. I know he wasn't in for, for the initial part of questions due to the COVID season in here, but also informed uh, Ms Bradshaw that it is something the CMO was meeting the, the Shielding Advisory Group tomorrow because we are reviewing on where we currently are. Because one of our concerns is actually we have seen an increase in those over 60 who are now testing positive actually out of the test rate that we have, um, roughly 23 per cent of every test. Uh, is for someone in the over 60 age group, and we all know that that is the most vulnerable section um, of our community should they contact or contract uh, COVID because there's a high incidence of ending up in hospitalisation. So it's a piece of work that the CMO is actually looking at, and he's been meeting with the shield, Shielding Advisory Group um, tomorrow to update recommendations to myself and to the executive. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Minister, for his answer, and I apologise if I meant Paul Bradley. And uh, hopefully, I'm, I'm not going to repeat her uh, supplementary. But I mean, there were some in the region of 95,000 people who originally got the, who got the original uh, shielding letter, and um, some of them at least have been in touch with me. You know, they know they're on uh, and families. You know, it's a huge number of families involved, and they're under uh, greater threat. And uh, I'm wondering, would the uh, minister commit uh, to an updated letter uh, to those uh, who were shielding? Uh, to give them at least reassurance and uh, any more uh, um, information, which is that? The, the CMO actually issued uh, an updated, although it was online and through, through social media, uh, about two, two and a half weeks ago, um, because we didn't post it out to everyone. Uh, the member underestimated us by the time we finished issuing shielding letters, I think we finished up at 208,000. 208, 
um, two hundred and eight thousand people. So the, the the number that actually finished up in that shielding group actually far outweighed our initial expectations. Um, that updated the guidance is online. I'll circulate it to the members so we can forward it to his constituents because it is it is an area of concern of, uh, for many. But when that group meets um, tomorrow and the additional advice comes out, I'll make sure that's also shared across all, all MLAs and health and social care sectors so that we can inform each of our constituents that are, have those concerns should they fall into renewed advice or renewed categories that we are concerned about. Mr. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answers so far. Minister, I'm sure you're as frustrated as I am and many others with the lack of decision making from the Executive uh, in recent days and the impact of uncertainty on our business community. Can you, Minister, confirm that if there is any easement of the current restrictions, does that increase the likelihood of further restrictions in the mouth of Christmas? Um, if there are any further easements, I cannot give that guarantee. Mr. McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, you have also mentioned that the vaccine uh, 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 is forthcoming, and it is a game changer, particularly for restrictions and the restrictions that affect every aspect of our society. You have mentioned that the rollout will happen uh, by age, but there are many in our community from a variance of age groups that have underlying health conditions, some very serious. Can the Minister give uh, any assurance to this House that his department will prioritise those with underlying health conditions to ensure that they get access to the vaccine as quickly and as swiftly as possible on its release, hopefully this year? As I, as I said in the initial um, question, I think to the committee chair in regards to the prioritisation of who receives that vaccine is actually managed by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, so that there is uh, an equity and an equality uh, across the United Kingdom, so that we don't get drawn into, I suppose, that political sphere uh, where politicians get to decide who has access to a vaccine and who doesn't. That is actually left in the hands of medical professionals who can best decide what groups need it and in what order should it become when it becomes available. Ms. Claire Bailey. Sorry, I didn't know how to question, Speaker. No. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to take it or no? No, sorry. Dead on. Um, Ms. Paula Bradley. Okay, and thank you to Ms. Bailey for that opportunity as well. Um, Minister, can I ask you if you could give us an update on how the flu vaccination programme is rolling out? Mm, I, I, I thank the member. I, I appreciated the, the one before that was easier to answer. Um, in, in regards to, to flu vaccination programmes, um, it, it is proceeding at pace. One of the things um, that we actually ha have done, we have increased the order of, of flu vaccinations. We did that through the summer. Our initial batch, which arrived, which was in the region of 665,000, um, our vaccination programme usually runs from the 1st of October into December, uh, and then the second batch arrives just in, in time of need. One of the things that we did uh, this time in regards to increasing how people get the flu vaccine, uh, the promotion of the flu vaccine, that initial badge of 665,000 was distributed. Uh, the majority of, actually, of it was actually administered uh, within 26 days. So the, the highly proficient system that we put in place actually outstripped the supply of flu vaccine that we have. The, the, the other batch is now due within the next couple of weeks, which should pick up on those um, on those who missed out and didn't miss out, but thought they were going to be uh, vaccinated at an earlier stage. Uh, for the children's vaccine, for the school age vaccine, that was all in place, and that still remains in place. But it was for those in the adult ranges that we really got ahead of ourselves. But one of the things that it has actually proven to us that when it comes to the availability of a COVID vaccine. We know the systems that work and work very efficiently. Um, and to update the member, I know, uh, know an update from one GP who sent out 500 letters, um, 499 of that 500 turned up. Now, that's unheard of anywhere else. And it's the fact they were able to trace the one person and they said they didn't receive the letter. So when we had that in initial uptake, it far, out, it far outstretched any of our expectations when it comes to a vaccine programme. But I think it was beneficial that we had taken the time during the summer to actually order additional vaccines as well, because they will now uh, supplement that cohort that has, ha, has been missed in the first stage. Ms Bradley. 
Oh, I'm getting a supplementary, even better. Um, Minister, just then to follow on from um, what Ms Bradshaw had said about the people and possible shielding letters going out, and we know that uh, we've heard from various people that they haven't received their vaccine yet, will they then become a priority, those that uh, will be required to shield and their family members in this uh, next tranche? Um, that, that was one of the pieces of advice and guidance that was actually put out that we did. Um, shielding letters were often based on who was eligible for a flu vaccine. So the counter works, but one of the things we did was actually expand to anyone who was a carer of someone who was in receipt of a flu vaccine was also eligible for the flu vaccine. So that's really why we saw that, that massive uptake at the start. It was something I know that came as a criticism for many, but it was actually something that was delivered far in exceed of our expectations. And I must congratulate you know, our GPs, community pharmacists and all uh, the peer vaccinators across our health and social care system who really went out of their way to deliver what is usually a three-month programme in 26 days. Uh, 20, uh, Mr McGuigan's not here, Mr Durkin's not here. Ms Armstrong can have one question if, the mini if she's brief and the Minister's brief. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, all of us have seen Dr Gillianne Manny um, talk about children hiding toast in their nappies. Um, Julianne's with the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. Could the Minister confirm what actions are being taken to ensure that um, benefits um, through communities are being allocated to those families um, so that children are not, when they're being identified by social services, that they're not living in poverty and without food? Um, I think the, you know, the story that the member raised um, broke many a heart and brought a tear to many an eye when they realised that that was something that was happening in our community, in our sector. Um, so the work that has been done through social services and identifying and supporting those families who need that help is crucial. Um, but it's also there's an also an onus, I think, in us as elected politicians to make sure that those those individuals know what help is available to them, know how to access it, and we make it as easy as possible for people who need it. So and that's you know, it, it's heartbreaking to think of the reliance that we now have on society in Northern Ireland food banks. Um, it's also, I, I think, a welcome step that the Minister of Education uh, supported, you know, the, the, the expansion of, of free school meals. But I think it's also an embarrassment that we had to do it, that we don't have the support mechanisms across our society that doesn't drive someone into that. That, that scenario and that, that provision as well. You know, we should, there's all a, a part of responsibility in all of us within the executive, all of us within this house, to make sure that a child does not have to hide toast in his nabby because it doesn't know when it's going to get its next meal. Thank you, Minister. That concludes questions to the Minister for Health. Members take their ease for a few moments and don't forget to wipe down the surfaces and stuff on your way out of the chamber. Uh, the budget, bit, uh, budget bill debate will resume shortly. Thank you.